Welcome back to uh, Ottawa Report, and I'm Mark Carr, and our guest today is Lisa Raitt, the MP for Halton and Minister of Labour. That's right. Uh, Madam Minister, you, you before the break we mm -hmm. were talking about uh, Air Canada. Can we pick up sure, on, on that? Sure, absolutely. I think the, the important thing we were talking about was, you know, the point of view of the workers and what I understood from the union was this pent up um, expectation that for everything that they gave that they would get something in return and they take a look, quite, quite frankly, and I understand this completely, they take a look at what they see the executives receiving in terms of bonuses and it upsets them because they're thinking look how much I've given in. So management should have taken that into consideration for sure when they were approaching their mm -hmm. negotiations. Um, it's not for us as government to to wade in and fix those kinds of things but certainly um, the emotion around the negotiation should have been really uh, thought Under through. Understood. Should have been thought through and it's, it's a valid emotion. So um, we received the strike notice from the, the, we call them machinists, but it's cargo handlers, baggage, everybody. Um, at the same time, we had the pilots union. Now, I think it's pretty intuitive that if you don't have a pilot, you're not flying a plane, and that's pretty as, simple. As well as if you don't have a mechanic, Correct. you're not, uh, you're not flying, flying a plane. plane. And that was, that was of concern. What was interesting, though, was in the case of the mechanics, their reach was far beyond Air Canada. They actually would affect anything to do with Air Canada Express, so that's, that's a jazz flight. So that goes from you know, a certain amount of flights a day to 1,100 flights a day. And you know, today we're seeing um, some labor strife at Pearson, as you know, and we'll talk about that in a second. And the reason, um, it just shows you, though, that the impact was going to be on all flights, not just Air Canada flights, it was going to be on jazz. So, the pilots are, are going through their process as well. To their credit, their, uh, their association actually started their negotiations in October of 2010. They knew that mm -hmm. there was going to be a, um, a lengthy kind of negotiation and they put their, their negotiating team into the table and between October of 2010 and March of 2011, they negotiated face to face without any government assistance. They were doing it on their own and they reached a deal which was rejected by the membership. Okay. Uh, not only rejected by the membership, but the entire executive recalled. There was such a, a stark reaction to what the deal was. And they had to reconstitute their executive, they had to reconstitute their bargaining committee. So they didn't come back to the table until November of 2011. And at that time, Air Canada had asked the government to appoint a conciliator. And what happens there is the clock starts. So you have approximately 81 days between um, your 60 days of, of negotiations. I take 15 days to decide. There's 60 days of negotiation. There's a 21 day cooling off period. So it's 81, you can be about uh, 97 days from the moment you receive that request for conciliation to a strike or lockout position. So the clock is ticking for us uh, in the Canadian public in terms of, of an Air Canada strike or lockout with the pilots. Now they they utilize the services of, of um, our department and we appoint a conciliator to go in there. Nobody from the outside, just one of our, our officials well versed in the files. And he helped them as best as he could. But we ended up in February with the realization that the two parties were extremely far apart at the table. And in and fact, there was no bridging that gap. There was no bridging the gap. I went in on February 6th and I talked to them. I went back in on February 13th and I talked to both parties here in Toronto. And I said, um, are you going to be able to get a deal in the short term? Both parties said no. What are the issues? And they're really far apart. They're all over the place. So we said to both sides, why don't you submit yourself to interest-based arbitration, which means mm -hmm. it's a binding process. So you abide by the arbitrator's decision, but it's kind of like appearing in a court. You both argue your point of view, you negotiate, the arbitrator's always there. And at the end of the day, if you can't do your deal within a specific amount of time, the arbitrator will say, well, I'll take we'll a little a bit decision. of this, I'll take a little bit of that. And usually what happens is you cut it down the middle and um, usually there's a wage increase of some sort. And, and he, the arbitrator puts themselves in the position of, if collective bargaining had elicited a deal, what would the deal look like? So it mm -hmm. kind of puts his, his or her feet in those shoes and you come to a deal. We offered that, Air Canada accepted it and the Pilot Association said no. Okay, so then we went back to the pilots and we said, fine, we'll provide to you an outside mediator 
um, and we'll give you a six month process. And they and they both determine who the mediator is I going was, to be? I gave them the names I, okay. and it was Madame Louise Otis who had just finished up successfully with the machinists, understood the file, knew the players, knew the financial health of Air Canada, knew and understood the emotions surrounding the negotiations from the machinists. Really the ideal person. So we appoint her to go in, both parties agree and they submit. And at the first meeting, she um, started scheduling it out for the next six months and the Pilots Association balked and they said, uh, we wanted this to be done on a shorter frame. And she said, well, we're here for six months and I'm, I have some business to do in March, but the minister has given a co-appointment of this gentleman and he'll come in and he'll do that. I can talk about it because the pilots went to the press and immediately talked about everything that was said at the table. It's the first rule of mediation that you don't breach confidentiality at the table. And Madame Otis wrote me and said, she wrote me and said that she felt that she would have to resign because the parties wanted to move faster. But she also wrote and said in a separate letter that she was very disappointed and surprised mm -hmm. that they had breached confidentiality. And quite frankly, it caused her to question whether or not she could be a neutral third party because of that fact. And she cautioned the parties about doing that at the table. So no, no more mediation process. Um, in the meantime as well too, the pilots, even though we asked them not to, went out and obtained a strike vote, 97%. Mm -hmm. So you could see where the you temperature was. You could see where was. it was headed. You knew where this was going. I gave a speech in Toronto in, because we had heard um, through the grapevine that rumblings that Air Canada pilots thought an ideal time to go on strike would be during the March break to exert the most pressure. And I gave a speech in Toronto at the Economic Club and I very vocally and very publicly said it would be a bad idea to do that. And really, you should be at the table negotiating. But that's, that's forcing the government's hand to do it, it, do it at that particular time. It does. Time. It, it does. It does in a way. And I was trying to be as open as I could. I saw this coming, and I was telling people two weeks before the 16th that this would be a real problem for our government. And if you think we wouldn't act, you should think again. So I gave that message. I did it twice on Friday and Saturday in open forums. Um, but as soon as we received the strike notice from the machinists, Air Canada sent us a lockout notice for the pilots. And I don't know what their perspective is on it. Quite frankly, uh, perhaps from their business point of view, they thought, well, if we're going out on a strike anyway, we might as well sort everything out at the same time. We can't operate with no machinists. We might so, as well lock out the pods. I don't know if that's their analysis. Whatever it is, all I know. But it's immaterial when you look at the impact on, uh, on the, it was on the public happen. and business. Yep, that's right. So both parties, we had a competing strike notice with a competing lockout notice, and our government acted. We introduced the bill, Bill C-33, an act to continue air services at Air Canada. And we debated it, and we passed it. Um, at the House, and then we passed it at Senate, and it received royal assent on March 16th last week. And there was a little bit of skirmishes at airports on the weekend last weekend, well, the week, you know, the week of the 17th, St. Patrick's Day, with some canceled flights. So Air Canada went to the Canada Industrial Relations Board to say it's an illegal strike, then they stopped it. So I think I, I tell that part because I just want to illustrate how bad it is between these two parties in their own employment relationship. There's a lot of acrimony and a lot of back and forth and, may, and a, maybe lot of, the, uh, a lot of issues. Just, just in, the, uh, in the last couple of minutes yeah. that, uh, that we have, maybe uh, Air Canada and, and the unions and, and possibly the government, because you've put restrictions, or mm -hmm. the, the government has put restrictions on Correct. Air Canada um, oh, yeah. th that are not applicable to other airlines in, yeah. in the industry. But in, in, the, in the last uh, couple of minutes, uh, could you tell us where it stands sure. right now? Yep. So we're, we're at a very um, intense part right now. Uh, yesterday I was flying back from um, some round tables I did in Occupational Health and Safety in Red Lake and Sioux Lookout and Northern Ontario, yeah. great folks up there. So we were coming in through Thunder Bay. I took a jazz flight from Thunder Bay into Toronto, landed at about 4.30 in the afternoon. I was alone I, uh, because my staff go on to Ottawa, disembarked, came uh, through the terminal and, and uh, had, a, had some help from Air Canada management, from concierge, to make sure that I could locate my bag. Because the big concern was, yeah. would we be able to find my bag? Because sometimes these things happen. And I accept that. That's just part of, that's part of being a politician. 
But as we started moving through the terminal, more and more people started gathering, and clearly they were employees, and they started chanting my name, and they started clapping and asking me if I was proud of myself. Now, they kept a distance. However, they were getting more and more critical mass, and clearly the intent was to prevent me from leaving the terminal. And if I did leave through those only doors, that there would be some kind of confrontation. Um, I'm not going to go that, into a situation like that. I'm not going to have any confrontation because it doesn't do anybody any good. So uh, Air Canada Security um, arrived out of nowhere about, and about said... 30 seconds. 30 seconds, <laughs> okay. yeah, because they're watching this happen. And I told you this before, Mark. I was, uh, I was grabbed at an Air Canada Centre uh, lease game when I was with my son by another disgruntled union member uh, about two months ago. So I'm aware of the situation. I'm aware of the heated emotions that can happen. So they take me back upstairs to the departures level instead of the arrivals. We walk around, and as we're walking, we're being followed by more and more, and Air Canada Security says, well, we understand that there's a big crowd that's trying to assemble quickly to see uh, if they can prevent you from and leaving the terminal. we've got 30 seconds left. Peel Police arrived. They were there anyway. They escort me out. So today what's happening is there's been um, um, disciplinary action by Air Canada against some of the employees. As a result, uh, the rest of the union's on a wildcat strike. Air Canada is appearing before the Canada Industrial Relations Board, and they're seeking whether or not there's an illegal strike. But I want to say to the workers, go back to work. Go back to work. Your union membership's telling you to well, go they're, back to they're, work. Well, they're pleading with them to, uh, to go back yes. to work. I heard that uh, today on a, on a news clip. Yeah. And, uh, to, uh, if they've got legitimate issues, bring them yeah. forward legitimately. Absolutely. So that's the where it stands. It is an illegal strike as far as I'm concerned. The CIRB will, will see it later. It is, it's put tens of thousands of people um, in really bad situations in terms of travel today, and it's not appropriate. We have an act that says there's not going to be a work stoppage. We have a code that says there's not going to be a work stoppage, and they're illegally striking, and they're, they're, they can't do this. And they, uh, I implore them to go back and, and that they should. Now, there's a story out there on, on, a, on the wire saying that I said that I would use police action. That's completely incorrect, and I can't stress that more. What that um, remark was about was the fact last night confirming Peel Police helped me get to the curb through the crowd, mm -hmm. and that's all that it's referring to. The government has no role in the internal management between Air Canada and its union, but I, I would just say that I hope cooler heads prevail and that we, we get the service back up and running. But as far as the government's concerned, we've passed our law and that's it. Madam Minister, I, I appreciate you, you explaining that to, uh, to our viewers. Uh, we've taken the whole half hour. We have, I know, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 <laughs> I, I, think it's, I think it's vital for you to get an opportunity to Thank explain you. it uh, in, in its totality, yeah. uh, how, how uh, it works, and, and give our viewers some insight into the, uh, into the process yeah. that you're following. Uh, and maybe, maybe what we could do is, uh, I've got another question for sure. you, but maybe we could do that on the web exclusive Absolutely. Uh, right after this. And for our viewers, we'd like to thank you very much for, uh, for tuning in uh, to the Ottawa Report uh, with Lisa Raitt, the Minister of Labour and MP for Halton. And if you go to www.tvkojiko.com slash Milton, you can hear our web exclusive and the question that I'm going to ask the, uh, the minister. So thank you very much for joining us here on TV Kojiko, truly local television.